Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Second Act Actors. I'm your host, Dr. Janet McMorty, and I'm still a medical doctor simultaneously trying to pursue a career in acting. Few housekeeping things before we get to my fabulous guest this week. First one is, if you have not already found us on Instagram, come on over and find our beautiful online community. We are at at Second Act Actors. I post a lot of bonus clips from each episode on there. Plus, that's where you can see me sometimes go live with either a guest or with another friend who has an acting podcast or, you know, it's just some surprises that uh, happen every so often on our little Instagram page. It is now Bitcoin and hacker free. Thank goodness. Second piece of housekeeping if you feel inclined to support the show financially, it is very much appreciated. You can head on over to my website, www.secondactactors.com, and there's a link there to support the show. It is very much appreciated, but I also fully understand the world is literally on fire. So another way you can support this show if you're enjoying these episodes is to like, follow, subscribe, add a comment. That feeds the algorithm monster, as I'm calling it. That shows up on things like Spotify and Apple Podcasts when you do that, and that's what helps people find this podcast. So anything that you do to support the show is much appreciated. Now, my guest this week is Victor Dobro. Victor is my first cop, police officer turned actor. But oh my goodness, is he not the last. I have so many former police officers turned actors coming up on this show, but Victor is the first. Victor has a 20 plus year history in law enforcement, including SWAT and police education. He has done a lot of fascinating work in the background, plus, you know, coordination for things like stunts or, you know, police expertise on film sets. So we have that in common. You know, I've done a lot of the medical consulting that some shows require. But, you know, those of us who've had jobs before, especially physically active jobs like his tactical work, people always say, oh, like you can go into, yeah, sure, acting, but what about stunts? And yeah, he's done a couple things in the stunt world, but what really, really appeals to him now is acting. Please enjoy this fabulous episode with the incredibly talented, badass Victor Dobro. <laughs> life you can tell a whole new story <laughs> it's crazy oh well anyways yeah okay take number 12 or whatever <laughs> tell me your story how did you get into acting well i'm a police officer still currently police officer for 24 years i was a cop in albuquerque new mexico for about eight years but during that time they filmed a lot of and they still do film a lot of movies in albuquerque and santa fe and I had a few friends that were on the best show ever, uh, Breaking Bad um, and Better Call Saul. And there were some others. And I was always jealous and of, of like how they got into it. But they, they needed them as background, but also as like police consultants on set. And that's why Breaking Bad was so realistic. Um, so I had that like kind of exposure to that and some other films, just like working on set or with friends, um, but never, you know, on camera. So fast forward, I come back, I moved to Maryland and I have a friend that met me through um, these fan clubs for Friday 13th and like uh, being a fan of like the horror genre from the eighties. And we would go to these conventions. I was going to comic book conventions. I was getting autographs on comic books. I was getting my picture, you know, pictures taken with, you know, these actors. And then it's going to the horror conventions just with the horror actors and, and stuff. And so I had a friend that wanted to do a Friday 13th fan film and he asked me if I would help him just to volunteer. I said, yeah, sure. I thought it was really, really cool. And my role kind of changed, you know, I was going to be like a stunt coordinator, even though I had no experience or like, um, you know, like SWAT team advisor, which I've had lots of experience. Um, and it ended up, uh, my roles changed a few different times and ended up just being really a cameo uh, as a lab technician crossing the camera, which is fine because it was my first time ever you know, on camera. So that 
that was re really cool experience. I come home and then my, my wife found a, you know, an advertisement for walking dead and road beyond. They were looking for CRM. They were looking for police or soldiers, like for, for former or current police officers or soldiers to play like um, these um, CRM soldiers for walking dead. I said, Oh, sure. So I put in for it. And then mind you, I had like no resume, no headshots, nothing. And so I just sent them a few different pictures of me, like in my uniform and I was what they're looking for really. So um, I was one of like just only 12, maybe soldiers that we rotated with, or, you know, there were more for season one combined with season two. And then I was surprised, like I just became like a featured recurring role and I was getting like these SAG vouchers for every day of filming. And, um, you know, I was handpicked by different directors for different scenes. And I was like really starting to feel confident, like, Hey, this is pretty easy. And I realized I wasn't even being asked to do much other than be available and look like you know what you're doing. Um, and so like that just led one into another. So I really, you know, working with different background actors, they're all great people. You know, I love them as my friends, but, you know, some of them have jobs where they can't really pursue acting and some, you know, they want to, but they don't really know how, or they don't have, you know, different people have different priorities, right. In life. So I looked at it like, um, you know, this is pretty cool. I'm going to just really concentrate on doing what I have to do, but I, I had no agent and, you know, background actors, typically they're hanging out and, and, the, and the discussion revolves around, are you union? Are you union? Or do you want to become SAG? Or have you ever been on camera before? And, you know, so those are all normal conversations, but like, you know, I have no, I had no agent. I had no acting classes and people are classically trained in everything. So I'm thinking to myself, like, I have to play catch up, you know, and they, some people say that could be a bad thing in the industry of trying to rush your career. And I just look at it as like being eager and, and like, I don't see it necessarily as being a bad thing, but just trying to like play catch up, like, oh my gosh, I need professional headshots. I need to work on my resume. I need to sign up for an acting school. And so like, that's what I did. And I was just, before I got on with you, I spoke to a prospective acting coach for like 50 minutes on Zoom. And it was just a getting to know you, getting to know me, see if this is a right fit. And that's what I'm looking at doing. So like every day I do something like update my resume, um, you know, update IMDB and just, you know, making connections and just like every other actor, but that's kind of how I got into it. It's just like a little bit of background. And then all of a sudden I just said, Hey, this is, and I'm kind of like that with hobbies anyways. And I don't know many people like that. And I don't know if that just means I'm ADHD or what, but like I learned how to drag race my Hellcat off of YouTube. And then like, you know, like one day I said, Hey, I want to click comic books. And then like, Hey, I want to click comic books and get autographs by, so I would go, uh, find out what celebrities were going to a convention. And then I would see if they were in any uh, franchises that there was a comic book made after, you know? So then I would, <laughs> so like I would go, go get, uh, what is it? A uh, Daniel LaRusso, um, Ralph Macchio, Ralph Macchio. And I would ask him to like autograph like karate kid comic book. Cause he's the karate kid or just, you know, stuff like that. Or like, you know, I'd meet some of the star Wars actors and I would have them autograph star Wars comic books. So that was just kind of my thing. And like, and then all of a sudden now I'm, I'm working with them. Like, like, you know, I was getting autographs from John Bernthal and then now here I am like working with them. And so like, that's, and I told him that story and that's really cool. Like I'm a fan one day and then the next day I'm a coworker. <laughs> so that's kind of how I, you know, and I, you know, I still fanboy over, over some of these actors, but that that's cool. Like that's a long winded, I guess, way of telling you how I got into it. Yeah. Did, were you at all performative? growing up like do you think was there something that fed into the performative aspect of acting because it's pretty different i think than being a cop correct me if i'm wrong well you know there are some you know there are some similarities some differences um but you know i can't tell you you know as growing up i always wanted to be a police officer i you know i can't say that and i can't say growing up I always wanted to be an actor and i'm definitely and i think every single human being has like some artistic side to them um, but some are like well, a lot, you know, I, I couldn't be a painter unless I, you know, train that way, but no, I never saw myself in that like specific role, but I just kind of, I'm a, I love, and I'm a fan of movies and film and like, not necessarily like how a director would look at things like a, you know, director, producer, but more of like, um, like story and writing and character development, you know, to the point where 
you know, if you're like me and you watch a lot of you know, shows and, you know, and you have some life experiences, you can kind of see where like the shows are going or like, what's the plot or who you think, you know, who the killer is. And I, I don't know what you watch movies and, and, and shows and some people have no clue what's going on. And you're like, can't you, it's obvious this is the person who did it, or they're obviously going to fall in love by the last episode or something like that. But so like being a fan of like how stuff is written and produced was really cool. And then like just a little bit of exposure behind the camera. Um, Cause there's obviously there's things I never knew, like how many angles you have to take for one scene. I didn't know that. So I didn't know like that people were, I thought when you or me are talking, there's one camera and it looks at me and then it flips to you and then it flips to me. I had no idea. Yeah. <laughs> you have to do these multiple takes. So like, and then I was naive and I thought that like, there's no way I could be an actor because there's no way I could learn all the dialogue that I would have to have, you know, for Titanic, um, the movie, like how could they memorize all that? That's impossible. So I thought like these actors were superhuman intelligent, right? Or <laughs> then I realized really it's only one scene a day usually that you have to memorize and it could be short, could be long, but I tell you what, I impressed myself because I, and I'm still like trying to figure out, can I do this? Do I want to do this? And, I, and I'm still saying yes and yes. Um, but I found if you don't memorize your lines, it doesn't matter if you have four lines, if you don't memorize your lines, you're going to have a hard time, at least me. But I also have tested myself and I said, I, you know, I found that I can memorize 80 lines if I've given three or four weeks. Mm. And if you've got the lines down, I feel a lot more comfortable. I can make my choices mm -hmm. and it's so much easier and better. So when people ask, like, is it hard to memorize your lines? Isn't that hard? And other people say, oh, that's the easy part. The hard part is the acting. And I, I tell people, like, I don't even look at it like that, hard or easy. It's, it's a must. You have to, and it's kind of old school, I guess, but you have to learn your lines, memorize them, be off book, they call it. Once you have them memorized, then you're free to be normal, to be yourself, to, to you know, everything from your, your you know, how fast you're speaking to how slow in your natural pauses, like that comes when you have your stuff memorized, not when you're thinking about what my next not line is and my next cue, you know, uh, uh, is, but anyway, so like, I, I found that I could do it and I, and I found like ple pleasure in it and it's, it's, it's fun and it's the second act. It's what I want to, you know, what I'm into now. And it's, it's what I want to progress to doing solely mm -hmm. <laughs> instead of, instead of police work and acting, just uh, drift away from police work and go more heavily into acting. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, there is a role for a police consultant, right? Like on a film set, just like there's like, I've done medical consulting on film sets. Yeah. But so what is it about, like, you could just keep doing that, right? Yes but what no. is, yeah. What is it about acting that's pulling you so much? Well, I'll, well, I'll just be, tell you honestly, like there's really three branches I was looking at doing is stunt work, acting, and behind the camera um, consulting. Mm -hmm. The problem is, not problem, is what I'm finding the easiest is for me to be an actor because the, the stunt is a little bit different because of my age and um, lack of specific stunt training. Now, I have training with like, you know, uh, self-defense, weapons, and grappling and all that, but stunt work is different because we're not like I can't really fight with an actor I have to pretend to fight with an actor so I know how to like take an actor down but as far as the training of how to take an actor down safely the correct way is it's like a mm. totally different skill so like I have done just very limited training in stunt work so that's really not a path I'm on anymore and and so like I just kind of had to realize that as far as consulting it's really my main goal or it was my main goal but I find that that is a very small niche of the industry. It's not well paid and you have to be well known before you're, you're, you're paid. So the market I'm in, the mid-Atlantic market of the United States, uh, nobody's searching out tactical consultants or police consultants or you know, military consultants. If they are, they're not going to pay them that much at all. So and that's the problem is that many people don't realize, just like if you saw maybe like a low budget um, project involving some medical, even just terms, or a, a hospital visit or a, you know, cons cons consultation. And you're like, ah, oh, none of that's correct. But you know, they may not know, or they may not care, or they may still be able to get the story across like, oh, they're going into, to, you know. So like, it's hard to 
um, be able to tell people like, no, you really need a police consultant. If you have any police or any jargon or any legal terms and definitions like that you're trying to convey to help with the suspended disbelief, you should have a consultant. But I, you know, I've only done it a few times and it's all been pro bono. And, and now really what I'm doing is selling that as a package of if you hire me as an actor, as a cop, by the way, you also get 24 years of experience. I do script analysis, you know, script review, uh, free consultation. So it's kind of like you get that. And there's one producer and a director on a project that I'm still currently doing who's utilized those resources. Um, so like I'm still doing it, but it's it's very hard. Like I spoke with Michael Kudlitz, uh, Sergeant Abraham from Walking Dead, and he was on Southland and he directed one episode of Walking Dead World Beyond season one. But he's one of the first, there's only a few actors that have told me that, like when they realized I was a cop and they said, hey, you ever think about getting into consulting? And I was like, man, that'd be awesome. But like, for me, I think that me, that entails, I have to move to LA right now to try starting to do that. But you now I'm friends with a very popular military consultant. And I would say like, he's really second generation because he came in under somebody else, but uh, he's a great guy. He's a former Navy SEAL. Uh, his name is Kevin Kent. And he's done so many projects. And you know what I found is unfortunately, like he didn't even get credited with Walking Dead World Beyond. Like I had to add, I had to add his credit to IMDb so he could get that recognition. But I'm like, you can you can do all this work as a as back, well, you know, as background, but even as a consultant and not get any credit. Mm. Um, and that, you know, he still got paid, obviously. Um, but that's I tell him often, like, you've got the job that I want. And then when I'm on the HBO show, We Own the City, I told the um, uh, Andre Severino detective, who's a consultant full time, who was full time for them as a, as a, he's still a Baltimore uh, detective. And I looked at him right before we started the scene. I said, hey, bro, I said, you actually have the job that I want. <laughs> so here I am about to film on screen, but I'm telling the off camera consultant that he's got the job that I want. So that's kind of tells you my mindset of like, you know, I want to be a consultant, but I'm finding a lot, a lot, it's a lot easier for me to get these acting roles and even like modeling and commercial auditions. And I never pinned myself uh, as a, as a model or uh, like a commercial actor, but like I'm taking the work and doing the auditions for experience. Mm It's interesting. I mean, you're just kind of coming back to your thought about memorizing lines and how you need to have yeah. it memorized. And I'm the same. And I wonder again, because if our brains are similar, kind of a very analytical stepwise approach to things, um, I am the exact same as you in that I need to have the lines memorized. And what has been a struggle for me is the story aspect of it. Like you were talking about what you really enjoy you know, from kind of growing up and stuff was, was the story and writing and the story building, because I find when I can release the need to get every line 100% correct down to like the decimal point in a number that I'm reciting off, if I can just let that go a little wee bit and just concentrate more on the story of what my yeah. character is trying to do, that's when I can be a bit more free and yeah. when good work happens, but oh, it's so hard. It's so hard. I, I hear that a lot of people make, like, especially with auditions, you know, experienced actors will say, that's not important. What's important is that you know the story. And, and mm -hmm. so I understand that you want to be, you want to know what we're talking about, kind of the feeling, the emotions. I get all that. But my mind says, if I don't know what to talk about, what does it matter if in my mind, I know where our story is? Mm -hmm but I'm not saying anything about it. Like I, if I miss a whole sentence to me, that's kind of important. So like, I, you know, everyone's a little different, but I know for me, I, I for me to feel comfortable, I need to be hundred percent off book. And then, you know what, I'll, I'll change it uh, to say, yeah, instead of yes. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. And thank you. Or, or, you know, I'll say, yeah, thanks. Because that's me and that's me being natural. So I'll change something off book slightly. Um, but I have to have them memorized or I don't, you know, like improv is hard for me, even though like I want to do more training with it. But when I when I do improv, especially like me as a police officer, I feel like I'm boring and I'm monotone. So I feel like I'm just like, uh, you know what I mean? Like, hey, what's up? Like, like there's no emotion. There's not. And it's like kind of because of the uh, the roles or the like the, the writing where it's not like 
I'm not a, a you know, lead character yet. And I don't, and anything really, but so I'm only, you know, supportive role. Mm -hmm. So you're just driving the story for, you know, driving the story forward. You're, 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 you know, you're given what the other actors, you know, you're taking what they give you, but yeah. So, you know, just being a, a critical, you know, cr critical of myself, like any actor would be, you, you look back and you're like, man, I'm so monotone or, Oh, I felt like so boring or, you know, then I'm watching John Bernthal and I'm like, man, he is over the top. He's oh. like strong strong choices maybe i should be like strong in my choices every time but then other other acting coaches and casting directors will tell you do not be theatrical everything yeah. is right here don't move your face too much they can see everything in your eyes yeah. but what's selling is when john bernthal is is looking left and looking right and he's bobbing his head and i'm like what so i'm gonna try to do that next time just start bobbing my head looking all over the place <laughs> what's what I think is so key and it's hard is watching tapes of ourselves back. And I've realized that's, that's yeah. really important for me coming from a theater background. I say theater background. I mean, I was in a high school play once, Yeah, but <laughs> I, I, it's, it's still, I, I am a very performative, cool. large person. Be yeah. And so doing the film and television where you're like okay everything needs to be here yeah. and they're saying do less do less do less i was doing a self tape this morning and my coach said okay you've got one tape done we've got one take down let's just do one for fun where yeah. you're going to plant your feet you're yep. not going to move and you're yeah, not yeah. going to smile yeah. just do it and see just do it and i watched it back and i was like that's the one i'm sending to casting it felt yeah. so monotone. It felt so blah and so bland and so, uh, but it was just, it worked for stupid. Films. I know. What you, yeah. I know what you're talking about. And, and what's great is the last several audition requests I've had, uh, they requested multiple takes. One, you know, mm. a couple of them had asked for two takes and a couple of them asked for three. And for me, that was cool because the first one, I was just like natural without thinking, let me get through it a couple of times. Usually the first couple of times it's rough, but after like, three takes of like your first version. Now you're comfortable. Now let's do something different. I had a, a, a really good uh, remote reader and I use we audition uh, mm -hmm. like 99% of the time now. So I had a remote reader tell me, um, try flirting with me in this scene. And I'm like, with these lines, there's no flirting, but I'm like, you know what? You should be able to bring any, just about any type of emotion with any, any script to give them like, Hey, I did not even see that. And you never know what'll work. So, mm -hmm. so um, um, for the, for the, uh, for the TV series that I was just ping pinned on, um, I'm not going to give too many details, but I'm, I'm looking at the, the stand, the, uh, you know, like the iPad stand and I'm looking at the reader and I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the reader up and down, but there's no reader there. It's just a, a, a skinny stand. So I'm like checking out the reader. Right. And I'm like, kind of like flirting with lines like that are very, um, uh, it has nothing to do with flirting. It's like, I'm giving somebody direct, like I'm giving literally like giving somebody directions, but like, I'm looking at them like this and I'm like, that's just for fun. Right. That's just another take. And then like, if you can do two or three, cause you know, that's the first time in the past year since I've been acting where I've been told to like give multiple takes Usually you've got to pick your best one. And that's the thing is don't show what you think they want to see, but like, what, what, like, what am I taping then? I'm taping for what I want to see. Like, so you kind of just figure, you know, the script analysis, like, what are we, is this a horror film? Is this a comedy period piece? What is this? So you kind of give them what you think they want, but having options is really cool. I like that. Yeah. Well, and that's, that's the, that's the joy of acting, right? Cause we, yeah. we so rarely get the chance to actually get booked on something and go act. So if we get the opportunity to give yeah. people casting three different takes, like you better believe I'm going to give you three different crazy options to be yeah. like, look at the range I have casting directors right, right. never seen me before. Look at what I can right. do. If none of them are right, at least you know I have range to make it right. I, I've never flirted with somebody on screen. I've never <laughs> flirted with anybody during an audition, but it's like I did it this time and I'm like, oh, that's cool. Like I just yeah. found something in myself like that I didn't know I could do. So like cool. check that off, like flirtatious. Usually yeah. it's dramatic, dramatic or instruct or you know, what do you call it? Um, you know, but never like, you know, a flirtatious take yeah. in a scene, yeah. but I, I, I gave it anyway. <laughs> That's awesome. Do you yeah. find 
are you able to pull or is there anything you're pulling from your career in law enforcement that you're now bringing into your acting career that's been beneficial? Yeah, de definitely. Um, and I've never really had like a triggering moment, but I can tell you, like, I, I know for a fact I was in a scene where it was kind of, it was like in a courtroom, but it was supposed to be like a town hall. And the town is upset with the chief of police. And I'm one of the cops in there. And I'm just supposed to be like watching the crowd, you know, just standing there. And it's not triggering me, but obviously I have these real emotions where I've been in large crowds in riots, disturbances, people yelling, pointing at police, really upset with police. And here I am doing what I now love acting, but I'm in the same situation of acting like I'm in that situation again. So I, I remember saying something to another actor friend, like, man, this is kind of like why I got into acting is to get away from this. <laughs> but, you know, it wasn't like, oh, I've had enough. Like, I can't do this. Like, no, I can do it. It's just not like, I'd rather do something else. Like, <laughs> I don't know, not something else, like another scene. But like, I, I did it. You know what I mean? And, and it's the cool thing is, is when they say cut all the all the people like that are acting like they're mad are now like, you know, they're normal human beings again. So it's like, man, I, you know, I wish I had that in real life. You know, I wish I could like, I wish I could be in a riot situation and tell everyone, okay, cut everyone. All right, go home. Thank you. You guys were great. But no, like, so like it's, it's so I'm drawing it and it's, I have 24 years of experience, like, you know, interacting with people like, the, you know, people in mental crisis, you know, emotional crisis, relationship crisis. So I've seen a lot. And so I kind of know what, like, the, you know, you, you study like, um, you know, sociology and different arts like that, but you kind of know what like normal human reactions look like. And, and then you know, they may not all match up, um, but I kind of like know what would be normal in a situation. And it's like how to carry myself, how to talk, how to interact with others. So I kind of, obviously, yeah, I, I use that and, and, and I bring it. And that's what, when they say actors that have real life experiences, because if you're a young actor and all you've done is modeling and acting, what else have you, can you draw from? You should, you should be well-rounded and have a lot of, you know, have life experiences. Yeah. So it, it definitely has helped me. Do you find, I'm going to draw a comparison to my other career in medicine. Yeah. Do you find it difficult to pull deep heavy emotion up and show it because i'm imagining as a police officer you have to be more kind of stoic in that emotional restraint in medicine we're taught to do that as well too um are you do you find it difficult to now as an actor pull up some of these deep emotions that you know as police you kind of want to be a bit more poker face well there's it's a good question but there's several different ways to look at it um well, first of all, I haven't had any, well, I haven't had too many scenes where I'm having to get that, that deep, I mm -hmm. should say. So that's why I'm doing all this training is try to like, now that I'm in these roles, maybe I need actually to get the training to get more roles or more lines or better, you know, better, deeper roles, I, I guess you could say, but I definitely have it, it, it. And here's like, when they, there's some videos out there that talk about like, if, if you're an actor and you want to play like you're drunk, you don't want to play too drunk because a regular human that's drunk may want to hide that they're drunk. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to necessarily be, you know, flying all over the place. You might want to look like you're trying to be in control. Um, so like, that's kind of how I, I look at that. Like, so when I have like dramatic scenes, like, you know, I can show like with my expressions different. Um, I always want to show that I'm trying to, uh, protect myself like you're saying like a police mm. officer i have to have thick skin so like this is a heavy and deep thing like i mean i had a scene where there's a dead body at my feet and so like maybe if you're not an experienced actor or, or you're obviously not a cop you might overact like oh my gosh and shake and it meets but like i'm playing like a more grizzly cop that's been on a while and we see this all the time mm. and i actually it's funny you said because i asked the director the producer um and uh, it was a lot of improv and, and we kind of had an idea of like, what kind of stuff you want me to talk about? And he says, well, what would you really talk about? You know, what would you say? And I would say, honestly, <laughs> and I'd say, well, if the scene is secure and there's no one around, right? There's no relatives around and it's a dead body. 
I said, you know, people can be pretty crude, like mm-hmm. the, you, you know what I mean? Like the, like the, the office of medical investigator, the, yeah. you know, the different, so like, and we have to be, have these like dark sense of humor to protect ourselves. Otherwise yes. uh, I wouldn't be able to function with PTSD. Mm-hmm. So I tell them, honestly, we might just like, kind of like crack, crack jokes about like the house or the smell or like how fat the cat is. Or, or so like, oh, I use that. And he's like, great, use that, use that. And I'm like, okay. So it's weird. It's kind of weird that like, I'm, I'm cracking jokes about a dead body, you know, and I'm cracking jokes about how this, how small and in, in, in the trailer is that we're inside and how it stinks, you know? So I'm kind of like cracking jokes and that's kind of like, I'm, so I'm definitely using that. Right. But that's my protection mechanism. I'm not like, oh my God, like I, I see dead bodies a lot. So I'm trying to show that in film and it could come off, you know, kind of what we call it crude, like, oh, so insensitive, but people have to understand, like, you know, the military, you know, it, 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 but you would never do that in front of family. You would never do that. You know, that's why cameras, you know, um, you know, change kind of aspects and stuff because you can't say what you would normally feel and say and stuff. But yeah, so like, I kind of just bring the hundred percent authenticity and then just like, I just act like this is real. So, yeah. and they, 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 they love that um, is the, the feedback I'm getting. But my, my fear is if it's not like a, a crazy scene where there's like death at my feet, if it's just me in the office, like I kind of feel like I'm too monotone and it's like too boring. You know what I mean? So it's like, <laughs> I, I want to have, I want to have as like really deep, you know, uh, you know, crime scenes, interactions with victims and suspects and stuff like that, instead of just like, you know, um, office talk. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So. Well, and that's where I think the acting coaching, at least for me, has been so helpful because they will teach you, at least in my experience, to regardless of what scene you're in, pull from your life experience. Yeah, Because that's like you're saying, that's where like, regardless, like, you know, for example, I did a self tape this morning where I was playing a serial killer. I (laughs) like, I'm never, never going to be a serial killer, but like, they're like, where, where can you pull from like your medical career, your life or whatever? that you can use in this character and make that authentic real scene come to life and i think you know the gallows humor you talk about like that's what they want and it's it's the same with like the performative aspect of being a police officer on 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 camera right you are comfortable with where your belt is where your gun yeah. is where your handcuffs yeah. are you know how to move because you do this every day you don't need absolutely to train because yeah. you're already trained those yeah. actions i think that's exact same with with the wordage of it right yeah. like what would it be how would this be real and you do this every day i think yeah. when there are such defined like tv tropes doctor cop lawyer yeah yeah that's where i think we have a huge advantage having trained as one of those yes yeah, because we have the mannerisms down to be the expert already yeah because we already are no I, d- I totally agree and you know i had another role too so i'm not i have no prior military but they say police work is like paramilitary even though we've gotten away from that that definition now isn't even nice, but I played a U.S. Army general in a period piece for World War II. And so I'm thinking like, this is the first time I ever said like, what do I do with my hands? Yeah. Like in a, in a scene, right? This is like my, what do I do with my hands moment? Yeah. So like I said, you know, I'm a, I'm a U.S. Army general and I'm in the scene talking to subordinates and I'm powerful and I'm loud and I'm angry. And I'm like, okay, I can get all this. But I'm like, what should I be doing? And then so I'm thinking to myself, and I'll tell you, I don't know if I did this on my own first and then noticed it in film afterwards, or if I subconsciously remember seeing it, but like Pearl Harbor with like uh, Alec Baldwin playing Doolittle. Mm-hmm. And uh, um, there's so many other, I can't think of their names right now, but there's so many other like World War II period pieces with actors and they play generals. And, and I went back and looked at uh, Woody Harrelson in, in an Apple TV series uh, or, or movie played like a U.S. Army general, and you know what? He used the same body language that I used, mm. and I didn't see I didn't see his until after I did my role. So what I'm what explaining is that like things like folding your crossing your arms across your chest is, is more of like I'm, I'm cut off from you, or you need to impress me, or you need to I don't know if I'm going to listen to what you're telling me, you know, and that's like a, a powerful you know gesture movement and then hands on your hips you stand you know you're standing you got your hands on your hips or your gun belt 
that's another like power position. Mm -hmm. So I just, I use those two. And then of course we did so many takes. I had to remember at what point did I have my arms <laughs> folded versus hands on my hips. But I go back and watch these other movies now and I'm like, uh, apparently I'm not the only one. There's other actors <laughs> that, that understand like Alec Baldwin and Woody Harrelson are doing the same movements that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And so like, like I said, I know I saw Woody Harrelson afterwards. I'm not sure if I remember how Doolittle, but like there's a scene where it's blocked where I'm, 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 look, I'm reading a map with my back to the, to the uh, you know, the subordinates behind me. So that's like a power thing. Like they're starting to talk with my back to them. Now I turn around to address them, but I'm learning that like that's, so I was never in the military, but like, I'm kind of thinking like, okay, I'm a boss. I mean, and that's why I tell people, I really like playing like uniform. It could be a, a lab technician, a mm -hmm. doctor, a, a, an attorney, um, wearing a robe as a judge. But like, if I have a little bit of a costume, it helps me, you know, bring that out. And it's a little bit easier. I don't know if it's like cheating as an actor, mm -mm. but um, you know, yeah, I definitely use that. Like, how would I be as a general? And like, all the years I've ever seen real generals behave. Or, and then, how do you see them behave on camera? You know, to make it. And it, my first take on it was to be a little bit louder, louder and angry, and, and talking down to somebody. And I said, no, that's a little bit too theatrical. Because this one casting agent told me, uh, you know, tone it down a little bit. Um, or, or to, you know, to be more, a little bit more reserved, but then like the director on this project says, no, no, we want, like, we want that, bring it up. Yeah. Bring, bring, be louder, be very angry. And I was like, all right, that was actually my first take on it. So my first, you know, they say you stay with your first gut instinct and that usually is right. But for that, that, you know, that one, uh, I was excited to do. Do you have any advice for anyone looking to change careers and start pursuing acting like you have? I do. Um, I would say, and I don't mean this to be cruel, but like, don't quit your day job. <laughs> so like, keep, so you got it. I don't understand what people say, like, they're just going to move to LA and become an actor, actress. Like, I think you need to, and then what they end up doing is busing, waiting tables and stuff. So have a career, get a career or have a job, try to have one where you have some flexibility, then pursue your dreams like I'm doing whenever you can, um, you know, do take every step you can do. And then if you're towards the tail end of your career, it's easy. Like if you're collecting a retirement check, if you're financially stable, um, but yeah, everyone's different. And then, you know, I have a, you know, very specific path and you have a path minus, you know, from that police background. So I can, I can sit there and tell another coppers, you know, an art, you know, somebody in the military or out of the military, how best I think they could get into the industry It'd be different for other people. But I would say, don't just, up and quit your job and say okay i have because then now i hear you, what, what people have is the uh the desperation auditions yeah. mm -hmm. where like i have to book in there and then i have i have friends that are looking at like low paying background roles which i think are beneath them but who am i to judge if they need the money mm -hmm. i'm de i definitely don't need any more <laughs> background roles i'm not doing any more background um actually but like um it's it's not a money issue for me so like, I have no desperation for me. It's the excitement. It's the learning. It's the having a, this new hobby. Um, and some full-time actors might resent that or, 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 you know, and say, oh, you can't go halfway into this. And you have to be all in. Like, I get it. You got to be all in to be as successful as you can be. But nobody's telling me how many auditions I have to do versus what I want to do. Um, but yeah, don't, don't quit your day job, but you got to, you can be successful. You got to do a lot of work and, and the, some of the background actors that I've worked with in the past, uh, they have different set of, of um, principles, not principles, um, priorities in life, you know, as far as like what jobs they have, their availability. I mean, I tried to get a, uh, a background actor, a line, or, you know, a role in several lines in a TV series that I'm filming. And he basically, you know, he thanked me, but then he said, well, I hope they're filming on weekends because I'm only available on weekends. And I said, I can't believe I just recommended this guy. <sighs> and, and people complain that they don't get speaking roles. But now he's like, you have to basically say you're available and, and then try to make yourself available, really. Mm -hmm. You know, and sometimes you double book sometimes. Like I'm pinned right now for a whole month on hold. I'm being asked to be on hold for a pin. So they say, like, don't change things if you're just pinned, like pegged or whatever you call it. But like, I don't want to. You know, I'm looking at like three different projects now in a couple months. So I don't know if I want to take on any more, 
until I find out what's going on with some of them. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, there's no desperation for me. It's, it's exciting for me to not know what's the next project, the next, I know what I'm currently working on, but it's exciting, you know, not knowing uh, what's coming around the corner. Mm -hmm. But I I, I'm only in that position because of the, the, you know, the financial situation and job. Yeah. And I think, well, one, I, I hate the starving artist mentality. I think that's such right. garbage, right? That you have to suffer yeah. and like be poor and eat ramen noodles. That's how you become a true actor. It's, no, it's so cliche. Uh, yeah. It's so right. It doesn't make any sense. I'm sorry. Um, what was I going to say? Um, but yeah, the, the desperation piece I think is so, yeah. is so key um, and being comfortable where you are financially. I think you can't really, I can't really express how important that is, even though yeah. it's not the romantic thing people want to hear about artistry. <laughs> but you're like, sorry, right, that's right. just the facts of life, right? It's just, yeah. you have to. And I think that is where, again, the authenticity can come from when you're acting, if you're not desperate being like, I need this role to pay yeah. my rent. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. But I, I tell you what, I have a friend. Um, he's on We Own the City and I'm in We Own the City for H HBO episode one and five. And he plays uh, Ed Barber, John Bernthal's character's field training officer in episode two. He has so many scenes, lots of dialogue, and he steals every scene from John. And he's a local actor from Washington, D.C. He's only been acting a year longer than me. So he's only been acting for two years. Almost all these independent, you know, small projects. And he told me the grind that he went through for, 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 for you know, his prior acting uh, project in Virginia, basically sleeping and living out of his car. Hmm. And I was grind. I, I tell people I was grinding because I was working midnight shift patrol as a police officer on midnight shift, driving home, switching cars, driving to Richmond to film, staying awake, filming, driving back, trying to find some time to take a nap all while having a family and everything. So I tell people I was grinding. He was grinding because he was living out of his car. So when he got cast for this role as the, as the FTO, field training officer, he, he said he pulled over and cried. Now, when I got cast as my role, I was ecstatic and I couldn't believe it. Like, oh my gosh, the first audition I've ever done on, you know, live, you know, I booked a role. Like, this is insane. This is awesome. Um, but I don't know if I cried. I was just so excited. But that tells you like, you know, I have a little bit of a struggle and grind, but there's, you know, there's other people we all know. And that's the story that we all love to hear how John Straczynski almost went home to live with his mother before he booked the um the office mm -hmm. and um you know the guy that played um was it star lord and guardians of the galaxy um i forget his chris, name chris pratt chris chris pratt was homeless yeah. living in a, in a van in hawaii i believe yeah. or something like that so everyone has we've all heard that but like yeah. many of the actors will tell you the only actors that haven't made it yet are the ones that are, are that have given up and if you're still working then there's obviously you know it's like you can't win the lottery if you don't play yeah you, yeah you can't make it in acting if you've given up basically mm -hmm. so yeah. when you talk about the grind i've seen it and that's a great story he, he did a phenomenal job and he's just a local actor in the mid-atlantic region and i don't know if he became sag just with that role or not but there's a lot of similar stories uh you know in the market that i'm in outside of Washington, D.C. and Baltimore, Virginia area. Mm -hmm. I think that I, I was just remembering what kind of triggered in my head with what you were saying just before I asked that question. You were excited about the unpredictable. You're excited about what the is unknown. next, right? Yeah. The unknown, yeah. the unpredictability, which I think the unpredictability of this business is a huge reason for the atrophy rate for people to leave, right? Because sure. they don't yeah. have, they don't have, they don't know where the next paycheck's coming from. They don't know where the next job right. is coming from. But I love that mindset, right? Like if we can, if we can keep that excited, um, oh, whatever next audition can be, like the big one kind of thing or whatever keeps you excited about the next day. I think keeping that excitement up about the unpredictability of this business, which will always be there, right? That's, yeah. that's a given. Yeah. But if we can keep that mindset of excitement, I think that's so key so key i like that yeah i tell people like like right now i mean i only have one, one check that i'm waiting on and it's not that i really really need it um and i'm forcing myself to work less overtime at work 
And I, I've tracked all my overtime over the years and I'm purposefully doing that so I can spend more time with family, uh, less stress, more time working out, eating healthy, getting more sleep, and then just, uh, you know, even more focus, focusing on, on the acting, but the, the training that I need to get in, you know, and, and stuff like that. But definitely is, is the, um, you know, I'm excited about my health and fitness. I'm excited that I lost 35 pounds while filming Walking Dead within a, in about 12 to 18 month period, I lost 40, 45 pounds. And that's by eating healthy on set, by wearing a very tight, custom made, you know, soldier, futuristic soldier suit. Um, and, and that, you know, that's what I find uh, ex exciting is, is the, the next project around, around the corner, you know, and, and, and just auditioning. And I told people like, because the unemployment rate, and, and then you got to tell yourself like these tricks, like just getting an audition is a win. And then getting an audition request is awesome uh, and getting callbacks is awesome and being pinned and availability checks. All these are wins for actors. Um, it, but you could also look at it the other way, like like you can do all this. But if you're not booking the roles, then they're they're not wins. But, you know, that's that, that's the way I look at it. You know, if some they tell you, like, you should audition and just forget about it and then just you're on to the next thing. And like, really, that's the only way to, to really look at it is. You know, sometimes I'll get a call back on something I forgot I put in for. I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm still in the running for that. Cool. Because I assumed I wasn't going to get it or, you know, but like, you know, like even like modeling and commercial commercial work, like I'll get callbacks that I totally forgot I put in for. Now, what I got to get good at is, is, is like booking out literally mm. is like putting, putting in my calendar like, hey, I may be in the state of Ohio for these two days. So I got to write it in there in case I do get it <laughs> instead, of, <laughs> instead of assuming like that I will or I won't. I just, yeah. I got to, I got to book out dates because I may get these. <laughs> so I don't know. Do you have any memorable on set stories from some of your shows that you've done? Um, hmm. I've had, um, I'll tell you the walking dead world beyond. I mean, every I guess every, every show, every movie I've done, we've had different memories, you know, but what's crazy is uh, like the walking dead world beyond, like I told you, like uh, working with the military advisor, Kevin Kent, former Navy SEAL. And so like, he's helping really block scenes and he's, he's having us march and do weapon movements different ways. And we end up like not using most of this. Like I went through training. I went through 80 hours of CRM soldier training. It's like a, a mini, I don't want to say Navy SEAL, boot camp or whatever but it's you know it's, it's about movements and room clearing and tactical stuff and, and getting us 12 soldiers from all walks of life on the same page with the same commands but like the memories on set working with those guys it will last a lifetime so it's really my first union job but all the like the the behind the scenes thing is, is just great because like it's just sheer boredom and you're just hanging out waiting for your name to get called or not called but standing next to like a real badass, a Navy SEAL who's been there and done that. And he's been on all these big projects like Transformers and like all the movies with uh, Mark Wahlberg and, and, and um, um, Chris, was it Chris Helmsworth? Um, all these big movies where he's a military advisor. And then, you know, we got these other actors and like the, it's like Walking Dead can, can kind of roll like a, um, like a soap opera. So it's kind of like just the human interaction, the drama, the dialogue, the like the plot of what's going on next. And all of that is like you're a background actor. You have no idea what's going on. You have no you don't you don't you don't even know what episode this is. You don't know the plot line. Sometimes they give you disinformation because they think you're going to tell like, oh, who dies at the end or whatever. But like so my memories really are just like working with, uh, uh, you know, Kevin, the Navy, the Navy SEAL and uh, other CRM soldiers and then just kind of like watching how they're blocking stuff and they bring in these um you know these stunt guys and like I, you know I was on my SWAT team and I was a, a, a sniper on my SWAT team but they would bring in like a um like a stuntman from like LA just to lay behind a sniper rifle and I'm like do they not know like that I was a real sniper like I you know they could probably pay me the same rate as a background actor but then just have me featured be behind the rifle so like you know, so I see these scenes now, like in different episodes where I'm like, hey, I, I, I know I'm right off camera. Like I'm in the scene, but I'm off camera. You can't even see me for another scene. Like they're in a house and like and like I know that I'm actually on the other side of the wall. Like I'm in frame, but behind a wall. 
Like, so you don't even know that I'm there and I'm just sitting there just rolling my eyes. You know, another actor's like hungry, thinking like, hey, let's sneak away to Crafty and get pizza. And then like, you're like, man, I really want to get in the scene. But yeah, there was one time where I just looked at the stunt coordinator and he was kind of in charge of, does he use stuntmen or does he use us? And I would look at him like, and this is late at night. And I would just look at him this one time and I just said, um, you guys aren't going to use me tonight, are you? And he looked at me, he's like, probably not. And I was like, okay. So I turned around and walked out and I'm like, I'm taking off all my stuff. And I'm like, hey, where's Crafty at? You know, but I had, I had friends that walked off set. I had like at least two friends that are like fed up. They're like, they're not going to use us. And they were so angry. But I was, uh-huh. you know, I was a, like a series regular. So like I was there the whole summer. And out of the whole summer, every day that I filmed, there was only, I think, three specific dates that I wasn't used. So I was used almost all the time. Awesome. But, you know, the the life of a background actor is like whether or not you're in frame and camera or how much, you know, and you you think just because you filmed one scene all day long, you're going to be featured. And then they cut it down and cut it down and cut it down. And then they don't use like the most, uh, you know, complimentary angle or whatever. Yeah. But you know, that's tough. And then you go back through all your footage and you're like, well, what's, you know, am I clearly seen in any of these? <laughs> yeah. I'm just this blur in the background. Okay. But that's like, kind of like, that's the life of background. Like you're literally yeah. background, but we own the city. They did feature, there's like a camera trick where you can kind of focus in on a background actor. And then now like you can change the camera angle or you have the main actors walk in. And I kind of like that mm-hmm. because what the camera is showing you is people like real people uh, that are important before like you see the normal actors like mm. these show these shows and movies where they just track the main actor the whole time like I get that but like every once in a while just focus you know on the featured background yeah. and I, I mean I say that because of being background but um, I have a friend who's a cop and I got him on the show he's never done any acting before and he showed up and they got him because he was a cop and sure enough he's clearly in focus on a shot in the tv show and I kind of told him, I told others, I was like, that I, really doesn't happen too often where you're, you're a featured background in focus and it's held, you know, you're, you're centered in frame and it's held. That doesn't happen very often. Um, but that's a cool story to tell about him and, and just the experience I had on Walking Dead. Mm-hmm. Do you have any final words of wisdom? Uh, you know, kind of, we talked about it before, but um, cliche but like never give up do 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 all you can but um you gotta you gotta do your work you're gonna you're gonna get out of it what you put into it and and you can teach yourself a lot off of youtube by listening to others you can do a lot of research you can read books audio books you can watch videos take little bits of information from everyone but um do as much as you can to promote your your career or whatever goal you know whatever goal you want But like I said, I'm sitting around with a bunch of background actors and we all are jealous that Rick Grimes uh, um, uh, is getting paid, you know, millions and millions of dollars for an episode or for a a minute of filming. And then we're not getting paid peanuts and we're not being in credits. So like instead of complaining, what can you do to improve, you know, to get to get to to get where you want to go. Right. So you take some type of action. So there's so many things actors can do. And, and, and some actors don't even do, do, do all these or do them well. Like we know that, like the self-promotion, but like the working on your resume, the headshots, the IMDB, uh, there's something, literally something you can do every day. But like a lot of background actors or a lot of new actors, that, and, and they may just not know, or they may not know, or they may, they may not have the funds. I mean, $30 a month may be too much for somebody to do uh, some subscription. You know what I mean? But if... Mm-hmm. You don't know what casting databases and websites you should be on, then you start asking, and then you, you pick up one, and then you ask someone else, and now now you've heard of a second one. So like just listening, um, talking to other, it's very important. Like networking is very important. Like I've gotten roles myself from networking, and I've given a lot of people roles by me networking, you know, to them, and that's something people don't understand too, or that is kind of. Like some people think it's a negative thing. Like, oh, it's who you know, it's who you know. But like, it's kind of like natural. Like I know you and if there's something filming in your area and I would like know like, oh, you'd be perfect for this. Mm -hmm. You know, so you do that for your friends. And then then that's not a competition because if they're looking for a female 
doctor, nurse. I know I'm not a threat to you, or I'm definitely not going to get it, or I already have my role in the film, in the show. Now I'm going to try to help the production by, by getting them somebody that's really experienced that's good that's and so like the networking so a lot of people don't network either they don't do the social media um or they don't you know they they everything is so competitive like i don't want to tell you any of my secrets because you might steal it but like i don't i'm not like that i you know i want to share like like my success and i want to learn from others um and it's nice uh when you can network and, and everyone wants a hand up and, and people, I think, up there realize that. Um, but I also saw some important videos where they, the people that are higher up, I guess the rung, if you want to say, in an acting in the acting world, they want to know that people below them are doing what they can. So I think John Berthold even touched on it once. Basically said that don't come to me asking me who my agent is. Don't come to me saying, hey, can you introduce me to your producer? Don't do that. Come to me and ask me what else can I do as an actor? What else kind of training can I get that you know? And I'm gonna tell you, have you done everything you can? Have you have you had your headshots done? Have you done any acting classes? Well, no, no. But people say I have a pretty face, so like those. Yeah, you know, maybe you can just rem remember me for your next movie. Like, so act the big actors, they're not gonna want to hear that. So they want to know that you're really putting in the work. So there's no, you know, there's different. I wouldn't say shortcuts. There's different routes, but that I learned recently. Like, you show everyone else around you that you're doing what you can do, and then. You know, maybe you'll get those, you know, those, those hand, not handouts, but you know, a helping hand, I guess, yeah. so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. I think, and coming back to your thing about, uh, you know, networking. Yeah, I agree. It definitely has a bit of a negative kind of connotation because people think of it as being like, like brown nosing. Right. But I think yeah. I agree. I think I would want to work with people that I know. Cause I do that in medicine all the time. Like I pick who I work with in the operating room because I know that they're really nice, fun people, talented. We're going to get the job done and we're going to have a good time doing it. So, so of course I'm going to pick those people that I've worked with before. So yeah. it, it just is human nature. And well, so, I, yeah, be nice. There's different ways to look at it. Yeah. For the, like the networking. Cause I hear that there's actually like networking, like, um, uh, seminars and conferences. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's kind of like, uh, okay, so there's gonna be 300 people all there being taught and trained how to network like that. Great. That's to me, that's, that's not what I'm looking for. No. I'm talking about like, I, I see your podcast. I friend request you. And I tell people just accept friend requests because everyone's yeah. like, oh, you know, I, I like to have a personal life and, uh, you know, I keep professional and personal separate. Like you can, but then how are you going to, how are people going to get to know you? Mm -hmm if they like you, if they want to refer you. So like, accept friend requests from strangers. If it, you know, if, if it doesn't work out, you can remove that. Um, <laughs> yeah. But like, you know, don't, you know, reach out to somebody, you know, mm -hmm. send a message and say like, Hey, I, I see your friends with so-and-so like, you know, but somebody just randomly messaged me yesterday. He asked a question on an actor's website or face Facebook group. I answered it. So then he sent me a private message. Friend requested me. I said, sure. Um, and I accepted and we just talked a little bit, but it's, you know, you might be able to help them out. They might be able to help you out. And it's one more, oh, you worked with so-and-so. Oh, that's awesome. So that's one more connection I just made just by, you know, responding to a question and him friend requesting me. So like networking like that, just becoming friends with people, not, not, you know, not trying to go to these seminars where I need to get in the room with this, this casting director from my region. Like I, I need her to notice me. Like, I don't like, they notice you that you're trying too hard is what they notice Yeah, that's a versus, point. you know what I mean? So like, I look at it not as a negative thing, but um, I don't, I'm not approaching it like that, the, the, that, that brown nose technique. And, um, you know, and then that's just vicious too, because people are stepping on each other, you know, and you make the other person look bad so you can look good. And I don't want any part of, of, of that. Um, but networking like in a good way with local actors and it's it's great like I'm friends with these actors now yeah. you know and some of them are competition I mean there's there's several of them actually that are that are competition for me so I may not share like the big audition I have coming because I may not want them to know about it and put in for it but I'll tell you as soon as I'm done then I can ask them after the deadline hey did you put in for that role and if they did hey cool good luck yeah I put in for it too Mm -hmm. or if they didn't because they missed it like oh okay because we all see the same openings and stuff yeah like yeah. i'll never 
I'll never promote like a role that I'm putting in for. Um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll ask them afterwards. Um, but a lot, I, I know basically who I'm competing against for what roles. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, we're, you know, and then some of them are friendly and, and some of them aren't as friendly. And it's, yeah. it's like, ah, oh, it's a shame. Cause like some of the, some of that, you know, uh, is limited the communication. Like I had asked this one person three times directly who his headshot, uh, who his photographer was. And I was like, I didn't know, like, is that a secret? Like, you're not allowed to say who your photographer is. So like, you finally told me, I'm like, cool. I'm like, it's so weird. Like I, I get it with agents. Like, Oh, who's your agent? Like, please don't, don't call my agent. You know, we're both white males, 30, you know, 30 yeah. year old white males, whatever. But like you, like, Anyone that's different, totally different, then I would, mm-hmm. you know, tell them who my agents are. But you got to do all the work. I can't, yeah. you know, I, I'm not in a position where I can recommend people to talent agencies. I'm in a position to recommend people for low budget, independent roles. <laughs> so I could re- I could refer you to like for this this little like project we're doing, but I can't I can't call a talent agent and say you need to sign this person. Yeah, yeah. So I think it's a little little bit different. I don't know. <laughs> I one last question that I gotta ask. Do you watch cop shows and do they drive you insane? <laughs> well, it's funny at different points in my career. Um, but yeah, I, the cop show I watch is HBO We Own the City. No, oh, yes. Uh, yeah, because I'm in it. We got the, the last uh, or the season finales on tonight. But I tell you, I became a cop because I watched cops live on TV is one of the reasons why I became a cop or specifically why I went to Albuquerque, New Mexico, just watching them. So we used to watch that. We watched that in the Academy. We'd watch that, you know, when you're a rookie. Um, But as you get more years on, you kind of don't want to come home to watch that stuff. (laughs) And it's funny because you would come home, you want to relax and unwind, but other people in the house might find it exciting to watch cop stuff. And you're just, then you're just rolling your eyes. You're like, like I just, I went through all that for like 10 hours and now I have to see this on TV. Um, but I, I've definitely watched like, um, you know, the, I would say like the good cop shows or whatever, but like the wire homicide is one of my favorites. Um, you know, there's so many different ones, even like breaking bad. It's not a cop show, but, um, different shows I've definitely, definitely can watch, but like, well, I, I won't watch any of the, the, the live TV shows anymore, like the mm-hmm. cops live or there's different variations of it. Mm-hmm. Like, um, cause to me, I just don't want to, to me, that's boring. It's what I did at work. So like, I don't want to see cops live. I would rather watch like a dramatic, you know, an acted show with like a cool plot and good, you know, like, um, Tom Selleck, you know, mm-hmm. as, as a, as a chief of police or like really good actors that I admire, I want to watch them Yeah. versus, um, like the, the live action, real cop shows. Yeah, for sure. So that's it. <laughs> Thank you everyone for tuning in and thank you Victor for being my guest this week. Thank you for being my inaugural very first ever police officer turned actor. But like I said in the beginning, you are not the last. You are in good company, my friend. I hope everyone will tune in next week for another episode of Second Act Actors. Bye. Bye.